How's it going, folks? Welcome to another fun at-home table read. Tonight, we are jumping into easily one of my favorite underappreciated Mike Myers films, So I Married an Axe Murderer. We're just going to get right into intros on this one, so start us off. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> my name is still George, and I'm doing the action description. I'm Paul, and I'm doing Charlie. Hello, I'm Mary, and I will be playing Harriet. I'm Eric, I'll be playing Tony. Hi, I'm Anne, I will be playing Rose. Angie and I am reading for May. And I'm Logan, and I'll be reading Stuart. All right, well, George, take us away. All right, so I married an axe murderer by Robbie Fox. Fade in, open on montage of various shots, San Francisco, dusk. Over this, we hear a recording of Jack Kerouac's poem, uh, San Francisco, which is accompanied by a bebop trio. Kerouac's poetry coincides with the various shots of San Francisco. We come to a sign for Jack Kerouac Street. We pan over to the City Lights bookstore and continue along to the alleyway where there's a large high contrast black and white sign depicting Jack Kerouac and his famous looking into the distance having a brilliant thought pose. Charlie McKenzie, in his late 20s, wearing a flannel shirt and torn jeans, walks into the frame in front of the picture of Jack Kerouac and inadvertently strikes the exact same pose. We pull back to reveal that Charlie has a bag of garbage in his right hand, which he deposits in the alleyway. We follow Charlie into the City Lights bookstore. We follow him through the store. By day, he's the assistant manager. By night, he's a poet. A man in his 50s wearing a beret and a goatee is reading Charlie Bukowski's playing the piano like a burka instrument until your fingers begin to bleed a bit. Charlie takes his place behind the cash register and resumes writing in his handsome letter on poetry journal. Oh, Scotland, your suckled teat of shame. A customer approaches. Do you have the book On the Road by Jack Kerouac? Every day there's a steamy, steady stream of tourists who come in to get copies of On the Road. Charlie is used to this, and without looking at it, went to a well-marked display of thousands of copies of On the Road. Another tourist couple approach. Uh, do you have a copy of On the Road by Jack Kerouac? Again, not looking up, Charlie just points. Thanks. Exterior City Lights Bookstore, night. Charlie puts the closed sign on the door and proceeds to walk home. Exterior San Francisco streets. The sights and the sounds of the city are accentuated by the bebop as he sees life, warts and all. As the streets become less populated, he can now hear the sounds of his own footsteps and a couple bickering. The streets become even more deserted. The night is closing in on him. A cat darts out from an alleyway and startles him. He quickens his pace. Rumblings make him cross the street to avoid the danger. Headlights of a slow moving car approach the distance. Really frightened, turns another corner onto his street. He approaches a three story Victorian home in which he has an on the second floor. He notices a light on in his window, a crashing sound from within. Cut to hands, taking papers out of a desk drawer. Cut to Charlie, carefully opening the front door and then gingerly closing it. He reaches for a baseball bat and a nearby umbrella stand. Sound of breaking glass from his upstairs, from his apartment upstairs. Cut back to a shattered picture frame with a photo of Charlie and an angelic blonde. Cut back to Charlie, finishing off the last two steps nearing the front door of his apartment but raised above his head, ready to swing. Cut to the hands. They clasp a jewelry box in the top of the dresser and stuff them into a duffel bag. The jewelry is followed by CDs. Cut to Charlie, pushing open, it, pushing open his apartment door in a mock swap maneuver, then stealthily stalking toward the sound of the intruder in the bedroom. He stubs his toe on a spring-loaded doorstop, making a loud metal vroom sound. He freezes, terrified. Cut to the bedroom where the hands freeze. Cut back to Charlie. Like a coiled jungle cat ready to pounce. He waits two beats, then springs samurai style into the bedroom. He freezes. Reverse angle to reveal that the hands belong to the angelic blonde and picture. It's Charlie's girlfriend, Sherry. Sherry, what are you doing? I'm leaving you. Oh, thank God. I thought you were robbing our own home. Because frankly, that's insane. I mean, what could you possibly get by robbing your own home? I don't mean to meddle, but isn't it better to rob other people's homes? Start accumulating their wealth as opposed to just reaccumulating your own wealth? 
That's not funny, Charlie. I'm really leaving. She continues to pack. Charlie tries to unpack her things. What? Just because we had a fight last night? We've had a fight every night for two months. Ever since I brought up the subject of marriage, you've found a fault with everything I do. Why couldn't we have gotten married, Charlie? I'm too young to get married. I'm only 29 and a half. We love living together. It's been two years now. I need something more. See, Sharon, this is frustrating for me, okay? When we first started going out, I thought we agreed that we weren't the sort of people who got married. That's like saying we're not the sort of people who are going to grow old. We're not, to, we're not going to fall into that growing old trap. Face it, you've got a problem with commitment, Charlie. Take a look at your other girlfriends. Every time they get close to commitment, there's something wrong with them. Hey, I broke up with them for good reasons. What about Sandy? Sandy was an alcoholic. No, 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 no. You thought she was an alcoholic. She just drank more than you drank. What about Jill? She hated my family. You thought she hated your family. Nobody hates your family. Everybody loves your family. What about Julie? She smelled like soup. What does that mean? Well, she smelled exactly like Campbell's beef vegetable soup. She was dirty, physically dirty. Well, Charlie, I wonder what you're going to say were my problems. Are you going to tell your friends that I was a junkie, that I wasn't supportive enough, or that I smelled like relish? Charlie, I loved you. Could have worked out. Think about it. She leaves. Angle on the broken picture. Exterior, San Francisco, Charlie's car, dusk. Charlie and his best friend, Tony Spalletti, are out for a night on the town. Tony is second-generation Italian-American with very Mediterranean features. They're listening to Teenage Fan Club. They pass Ghirardelli Square. Tony, Teenage Fan Club. They're Scottish, you know? Oh. I had that dream again. Oh, is that the one where you suspect that a fat man in a diaper on a lazy Susan has interfered with uh, your, your plans for the evening, huh? No, but I, I ha have had that one. No, in, in this one, I'm in love. Yeah? And I say to myself, I finally found somebody that I'm truly comfortable with. You know, when you're so comfortable that you'll let them put makeup on you to see what you would look like if you were a girl. Anyways, you know what I want to do in the dream? <clears throat> you know what I do in the dream next? You propose? No. I die. But Charlie, you're, you're a normal suburban guy at heart from, from, a, from a normal suburban family. Don't, don't you tell me you always wanted to get married and have a family? Yes, but I'm afraid, okay? There's seven main rites of passage in a man's life. Birth, first day of school, last day of school, marriage, kids, retirement, death. I'm in marriage. I'm two rites of passages away from death. Oh, I'm sorry, I wasn't listening. Tony is doing 360s, scoping out beauties, when suddenly his roving eyes lock on a police car directly behind them. He slouches down into his seat. Christ, the cops. Tony, you're a cop. I know, isn't it awful? I work with those guys, they're assholes. The police car passes. Interior Spalletti's coffee house, night. Tony and Charlie enter, there's the poet on stage. The club is full of art tarts and college bohemians. They're greeted by the club's owner, Giuseppe, an Italian man in his 50s. Salve, zio mio. Laura. Che cazzo fai, Charlie? Hi, Uncle Giuseppe. Tony, come. Stay bello. E tu, papa. E allegra uh, par taza volta. Tony's uncle shows them to a table. I'll have a waitress bring you a cappuccino. What did your uncle say? He says my dad's back in jail again. Oh, I'm sorry, man. You know, it's funny. I don't even feel related to my parents anymore. I feel, like, I feel like your mom and dad are more like my parents. I feel more Scottish than Italian. Tony Spilletti. I don't think you can get more Italian than that. Unless, of course, your name was Tony Italian guy. Charlie checks out the girls in the coffee bar. So bummed. Sure, he was great, wasn't she? I'm an asshole, aren't I? Yes. 
You've got to help me get through this night. You just got to get back on the horse. The waitress arrives with two cappuccinos and extremely large cups like they have in France. Waitress, I'm sorry. There seems to be a mistake. I ordered the large cappuccino. Two girls at a nearby table laugh. Charlie and Tony exchange. This could be promising looks. Do you think these cups could be larger? They're practically bowls. The girls laugh again. I feel like I'm having Campbell's cappuccino. Yeah, join us in a cup of coffee. There's enough room. Sure. <laughs> the girls come over. My name's Susan, and this is June. We think you're funny. My name's Tony. This is my friend, Charlie. Look, Tony, I'm going home. See you later, girls. Tony grabs him and pulls him aside. You really don't understand, do you? When a girl comes over to your table, the table and says, I think you're funny, it means you've pretty much been given the keys to the sink. Charlie, this is big. Perhaps you've confused me with someone who gives a shit. Here's what's going to happen, Tony. We'll end up going out with him tonight, maybe even home with him. Well, go out for two months. Soon she'll move in. We'll be happy. She'll want more of a commitment. I'll be terrified, and I'll do something to ruin it, just like I did with Sherry. He leaves. Tony is left with the two girls. Poor guy. He seems so nice. I just broke up with somebody as well. She left me high and dry. The girls try to cover him. Interior Charlie's apartment. Three quarters of the furnishings and items have disappeared with Sherry. Charlie sits dejectedly on the floor over his poetry journal. He's missing Sherry. We see Charlie's face. He looks out and is struck by an idea and begins to write. Angle on the journal. I am lonely. Charlie's face. Again, he looks out, finds his inspiration, and continues to write in the journal. It's really hard. Charlie's face. A gentle tear rolls down his left cheek. He pauses, then finishes off the stanza. In the journal, this poem sucks. After the last line, he scratches out the entire poem. He closes the book and turns on the TV set to CNN to veg out. The show is What's Cooking with Wolf. Exterior of San Francisco Street. Charlie is driving in his car. He drives slowly, looking for an, ad an address. Finds it, slips into a parking spot in front. Exterior butcher's shop, meats of the world. Adorning the front are a grand opening sign and many flags of the world. Charlie goes inside. Interior butcher's shop. It's a small hip shop selling specialty meats from around the world. Charlie looks around. Suddenly, an attractive woman in her late 20s wearing a bloodstained smock enters. It's Harriet Michaels. She has a cleaver in one hand and something bloody in the other. Goddamn shoplifter. Uh, but I got him. Uh, you're next. I've come at a bad time. No, stay. No, no, really. Obviously, you've got things you have to do. You've got to dismember the rest of his bloody torso. Dig a makeshift shallow grave, cover the body with quick lime. Really, so much to do, so little time, and I'm only in the way here. I'm just gonna go. Good luck. Oh, oh, th this, uh, no, 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 this, is, this isn't what he stole. This isn't a piece of him or anything. Um, this is, I... Uh, this is Icelandic shank. I bet it goes well with an ice Chianti. Uh, can I help you? Yes. Do you have haggis? Yes, we do. It's over here in our Scottish cuts section. One? This is a section under glass flying a Scottish flag with haggis and various cuts of Scottish meat. Yes, I've never been able to find haggis anywhere except at my parents' house. They're Scottish. Harriet rounds the corner and wraps the haggis. Behind her is the large Prussian venison sign. That'll be uh, 15... 79. Will there be anything else? Yes. I know it's a long shot, but you wouldn't by any chance happen to have any Prussian venison? Now, where in the world would I get Prussian venison? Charlie's Charmed. Exterior, San Francisco Street. Charlie is driving along listening to Kerouac. We absorb the flavor of San Francisco as he drives down 
Lombard Street. Exterior, Charlie's parents' apartment building, night. An old, crappy apartment building in San Francisco. Charlie's car pulls up here Saturday night by the base of the rollers. Interior, outer hallway of Charlie's parents' apartment, night. Charlie approaches the door. Mom, Dad, I'm here. Get in here, son. The apartment is assigned to Scotland. Scottish paraphernalia, miniature Scotty dogs, shortbread tins, and on wall. Framed pictures depict famous Scotsmen, Sean Connery, Jackie Stewart, Alexander Graham Bell, James Doohan, a.k.a. Scotty from Star Trek, Sheena Easton, Billy Connolly. Charlie's POV as we enter the living room. We see Stuart, May, Danny, and little William, Charlie's 14-year-old little brother, all singing. S-A-T-U-R-D-A-Y. Night. Come on, give your old man a kiss and I'll kick your teeth in. The group are eating dinner on TV trays. Charlie walks over and turns off the record. Charlie, put on Charlie Pride, would you? Oh, I love Charlie Pride. Hey, did you see, did you happen to see the most beautiful girl in the world? Me! Shut it! Stuart McKenzie is in his late 50s, a butcher with Coke bottle glasses and a thick head of black hair. His red-haired wife, May, is attractive with a soft but tough appearance. Little William has a very large head and a skinny neck. Like Charlie, he was born in America. Charlie gives his mom a hug, his father a kiss. Hey, William. Touching the hat inside. Hi, Charlie. Scores magical. On the television, Stewart's team, Glasgow Celtic, has scored. Hi, magic. Uh, let's have a look at the replay. William, move your head. Look at the size of that boy's head. I'm not kidding. It's like an orange on a toothpick. Stewart, you're gonna give the boy a complex. I'm not kidding. That's a huge noggin. It's a, got its own weather system. It's a virtual planetoid. Head! Move! We see the replay of the goal on TV. Tony sits down and May brings over a plate of stew and three types of potatoes piled very high. Is that enough potatoes, Charlie? Uh, enough to recreate Devil's Tower in Close Encounters. Do I smell haggis? Aye, you do. I'll put it in the fridge. Charlie notices Tony reading some papers. He realizes it's literature from the Lyndon H. LaRouche Society. Dad, what are you doing to Tony now? Why do you abuse his mind like this? That's the latest report from Lyndon M uh, H. LaRouche, outlining how the Queen and the, the Rothschilds mastermind the Soviet overthrow, and that they could reclaim the lands so the annex to the Holy Roman Empire. You know, a lot of this makes sense. I think you're suffering from the Stockholm Syndrome, where the hostages start to relate to their captors. Listen, Sonny Jim, it's a known fact that there's a society of the five wealthiest people in the world called the Pranaverate, who run everything and meet three times a year at a secret country mansion in Colorado known as the Meadows. And that's obviously why we haven't heard about it in the newspapers. That's right. They fucking own the paper, smartass. And everything else. Why do you think Scotland's not been able to get independence? Because the Queen's, the Panaveret, and those English domeids in Westminster won't have it. Who are the other members of this Pentaveret? The Pentaveret, the Queen, the Rothschild, the Gettys, the Vatican, and Colonel Sanders before he went tits up. Oh, I hated the Colonel with his wee beady eyes and a smug look on his face. Dad, how can you hate the Colonel? Because the colonel puts an addictive chemical in it that makes you crave it fortnightly. Interesting. Would anyone like some juice? Charlie, did I tell you about a juice tiger? A juice tiger? Aye, a juice tiger. It's a part of my National Enquirer Garth Brooks diet. Do you like potato juice? Thank you, no. Sherry's late. Yeah, uh, Sherry and I broke up. Oh, you didn't. Sherry was a daughter your father never was able to give me. I'm just not ready for marriage. I'm 29 and my poems haven't even been published yet. But it's just that, it, it's not just the poetry, is it, son? You're afraid to get married or you'll lose your muse. 
Look at me. I was a strapping young butcher at the height of my creative powers. Then it came to deboning a side of beef and there was nobody could touch me. Then I married your mother. People would stand still in awe as I filleted a shoulder of lamb. Maybe it's just as well to not get married. Look at the news. Where, where did I put it? Heat! Move that melon of yours into the bathroom and get the paper for your mother! We have gets the National Enquirer and brings it back. That's not news, Dad. That's bullshit. I wouldn't mind wipe my ass with that paper. What are you talking about? It's the fifth highest circulating paper in the United States, I'll have you know. Oh, here it is. Mrs. X, the honeymoon murderer. She marries men under fake identities and then murders them. She killed some German martial arts expert and some plumber named Ralph Elliot. Her whereabouts are unknown. There's another goal on the TV set. I swear, that boy's head's like Sputnik. Spherical, but pointy. That was a bit offside, wasn't it? He'll be crying himself to asleep tonight on his gigantic pillow. Ah, this score is too old! Magic! Ah, beautiful goal! Uh, we hold on the TV set. Time passes. Uh, the TV set crossfades to the end of the game. The two teams are shaking hands, and the final scores uh, show Celtics beating Rangers 3 0. We see Charlie and Tony are leaving. Stewart is blind drunk. You're in my eyes, you're in my dreams. You're Celtic United and baby, I've decided. Ah, oh, you're steaming. She meets Charlie and Tony at the door and kisses him goodbye. She turns to kiss Tony and holds on the kiss far too long. Wait a minute, Mrs. McKenzie. Oh, you've turned into a sexy Italian bastard. See you later, Mom. See you later, Dad. Fine! Go! You stay at your hour! Charlie and Tony leave and enter the hallway where they find William sitting on the stairs waiting for them. With you. <laughs> Exterior meets of the world late afternoon. Charlie drives behind Mrs. Harriet, who's unwinding the store running in Dutch national costume. The banner announces Dutch Week. Meets of the world salutes Dutch meat. Charlie slows down to look at her. She looks great in her little Dutch costume. Interior City Lights Bookstore, day. Charlie is again writing at the counter. Another person enters. Excuse me, you wouldn't happen to have... Charlie again points to the Kerouac section without looking up. Thanks. On the pad, Charlie writes, Oh, meat maid, if the cattle had had a choice, they would have slotted themselves willingly for a chance to be touched by your fingers. Cut to Charlie's face. She's on his mind. Exterior meets of the world. Charlie's car pulls up. The sign reads Welsh Week. Meets of the world salutes Welsh meats. Interior meets of the world. The store is very busy. There's a line at the meat counter seven people deep. Charlie takes place at the end of the line. We see a montage of a person's hands chopping a rack of lamb into lamb chops and carving meat with surgical efficiency. Oh, hi. Haggis, right? It was a, it was a big hit. I remember you told me you were Scottish, but do you really like haggis? No, I think it's repellent in every way. In fact, I think most Scottish cuisine is based on a dare. <laughs> Harry laughs. Uh, can I help you? Uh, sorry, I'm really busy. Look, um, my dad's a butcher. Do you need a hand? Well, actually, yes. Charlie puts on a very stylish butcher's sock and crosses behind the counter. Can you get me four Belgian porterhouses? Do you know what a porterhouse looks like? I'm meat literate. Time passes. We see a montage of Harriet and Charlie serving customers, ending on a customer POV of Charlie. Yes, do you have any fresh blubber? I'll check. You want blubber, right? Yeah. We see Charlie's POV of an Eskimo with a lower 48th accent. My parents are coming to town. You know how parents are. They'll drive you nuts. The Eskimo exits. There are no customers left. Look, I'm really grateful. Can I have you some meat as payment? Please, help yourself to some meat. I'm trying to be a vegetarian. Trying to be vegetarian? Yeah. The problem is I really love hot dogs. 
I think the meat industry invented hot dogs to stop people from becoming vegetarians. There's got to be something I can repay you with. You could take me to a nice romantic dinner. Exterior Peter, night. Charlie and Harry are eating hot dogs. Charlie puts the relish on, he smells the relish. This reminds me of my ex-girlfriend. I hate talking about old relationships. Then let's not, and say so we did. <laughs> that was easy. What a nice guy. You've probably never done a mean thing in your life. You'd be surprised. I'd like to hear. Name me something bad you've done in your life. Are you kidding me? No. Did you ever steal anything? You ever hit someone? Well, I've been in fights. Uh, let me think. Not one bad thing, Charlie. Tell me something bad you've done, and it better be bad. I mean, evil. How evil? Really evil. Like, how many people have you brutally murdered? Brutal is such a subjective word. I mean, what's brutal to one might be totally reasonable to another. Next to them is a German couple speaking German, looking through a coin-operated document. He says something which causes her to cry. This just reminded her of what that scene in Brian's song. Actually, he just proposed to her. Those are tears of joy. She lifts her soda to toast them. Frost. The man and woman smile and nod. Danke, Fräulein. You're very smart. It's a shame going to have to destroy you. Do bright women intimidate you? No, not at all. Really? What do you look for in a woman you date? Well, I know everyone always says sense of humor, but I'd have to go with breast size. <laughs> How about you? And a guy? Income, of course. And then savings. He smiles at her. Me likey how you think he. Interior Harriet's apartment night. The lights turn on and they enter a very bohemian apartment. There's artist paraphernalia strewn around. A small bar separates the living area from the kitchen. She smiles and walks off into the kitchen. I'll make us some tea. He checks out her apartment. On the wall, there's a huge poster of the boardwalk in Atlantic City. Hey, you know what this apartment needs? A really large oversized poster of Atlantic City. I used to live there. That's where I had my first supermarket job. On the way out, he peeks into the bedroom where he finds a bed that is facing neither parallel nor perpendicular with the wall. It's just kind of there. I only have chamomile. I hope that's all right. He looks at her and then at the oddly placed bed. It's north-south. For, for health reasons. See, I, I had this friend. He was a martial artist expert. Anyway, he used to sleep north-south. I don't know. It's a martial arts thing. It just sort of became a habit with me. You know, Scotland has its own martial arts. It's called fuck you. It's mostly headbutting and kicking people when they're on the ground. Harriet starts laughing, then so does Charlie. They, they lean into each other, pretty close, too close even. And when it seems like they're gonna kiss, Charlie suddenly gets uncomfortable and looks at his watch. Late? No, no, not for me. Who for then? Who for then what? Well, you looked at your watch and said it wasn't late for you. I wondered who it was late for. Not me. No, sir. Not here. <laughs> Maybe it is late. She gets him his coat. He starts to leave. But the truth is, yes, I had a great time and I'd like to kiss you. But if we do kiss, then we'll kiss on the couch. And if we kiss on the couch, then we'll kiss in the bedroom. And once you're in the bedroom, well, the thing is, I always rush it. And this time I feel like maybe I should wait. Maybe we should let it build naturally and grow instead of just immediately spending the night together. I want to spend the night together. I have no problem with that. Uh, the bedroom, middle of the night. They're both fast asleep. She's curled up in his arms. Suddenly she begins to speak. Yes, yes. Charlie's eyes open, he smiles. 
Yes, Ralph, I will, Ralph. Charlie's smile fades. He sits up and looks at her. She's lying completely still on the bed, her eyes closed and still sleep talking. Now, now, Ralph. Harriet, Harriet, you were having a dream or you, you kept saying the name Ralph. Ralph? Ralph, I heard you say it. Hmm, that's odd. Just today I was singing about her. Hmm, she's my friend. Is she nice, Ralph? Yeah, she's great. Dissolve in two, Harriet's bedroom, morning. Charlie is sleeping alone in the bed and the sound of running water is heard off in the distance. His eyes slowly open, he looks around, remembers where he is. He puts on his shorts and walks towards the bathroom, interior bathroom. Through the steam, we can just make out Harriet in the shower washing her hair. Charlie walks over. You know, with this drought in California, total strangers are urged to shower together. He opens the curtain. It's not Harriet. The woman, Rose, calmly looks at him and closes the curtain. Go away! Oh God, I'm sorry. Jesus, excuse me. He backs out of the room. Interior hallway of Harriet's apartment. The door opens and a hurriedly dressed Charlie emerges. Before he gets to the door, he once again encounters Rose. She's completely dressed, even her hair is dry. Oh, sorry. Hi, I'm really sorry. I must have scared the... I'm Harriet's friend, Charlie, and you must be... Ralph? I'm Harriet's sister, Rose, and this is Harriet's note. He reaches for it, but she reads it aloud to him. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Dear Charlie, I didn't want to wake you. Make yourself at home. Thanks for making me smile. <laughs> Harriet. That's a very nice note. I'll make you some breakfast. Oh, gee, I'd love to, but I'm running late. What would you say to blur bleh, blueberry pancakes, bacon, fresh squeezed grape juice, and Kona coffee? Interior kitchen later. Charlie and Rose at the table, each eating, a, each eating a bowl of dry cereal. Sorry, I didn't have any of those other things. Uh, hey, that stuff will kill you while your Fruit Loops are light and probably reasonably high in fiber. I like Apple Jacks, too. Uh, so this is your apartment? Rose starts sketching Charlie. Yeah, she's been here the past three months. Uh, ever since she came back from Miami. I used to visit her occasionally. She didn't speak of me? She told me about a martial arts guy and there was some discussion about Ralph. She spoke of them. She spoke of the martial arts guy and screamed about Ralph. Well, you know Harriet. Actually, I, I really don't. Um, but you did have sex with her. Hello! It, it, yet you still don't know her? See, that's the problem with sex. It's, it's not very revealing. My, look at the time. He stands up. You should be careful, Charlie. I am, usually. I just, you should know this is very unusual that I would do this so soon in this day and age particularly, but we just really hit it off that we did. And I'm gonna go now. I won't tell Harriet that anything happened. But nothing happened, nothing did happen. Exactly, or she would be jealous and when she gets jealous, we both know what she's capable of. No, we don't. You do. Like I said, I just met her. You'll be okay, Charlie. Just, just be careful. She leaves. Charlie is baffled. Interior City Lights Bookstore Day. As Charlie walks by, Fred, a lanky customer in his late teens, is buying a book. Hey, Charlie, how you doing? Good, good. Look, Fred. You got a lot of girlfriends, right? You know any girls named Ralph? Ralph? Gee, Charlie, isn't that a guy's name? Well, not necessarily, but mm, never mind. Thanks, Fred. 
Charlie catches the store manager, Penny, on her way into her office. Hey, Penny, I wanted to ask you. You know some girls named Ralph, right? I mean, that's a girl's name also, isn't it? Don't think so, Charlie. Uh, Forget it. Thanks. She walks into her office, totally confused. Exterior dockside, Alcatraz tour kiosk, mainland day. Tony and Charlie are waiting in line. Aerial view of the boat as they travel to the island. You know, I've lived in the city all my life, and I've never been to Alcatraz. Alcatraz. We open on the loud banging of a cell door. We find our tour group in the holding area. The park ranger is a beefy man in his late 50s and talks with emotionless military precision. Hello, everyone. I'm a park ranger, and I will be leading you on the tour. All the park rangers here at Alcatraz were at one time guards, myself included. My name is John Johnson, but everyone here calls me Vicky. Will you please follow me? They're let out. We see that Alcatraz is a sinister place, cold and unforgiving. The park ranger leads them to the center of a cell block. You're glowing, Charlie. Man's in love. Shh, stop it. I'm trying to listen. This is the main cell block area, home to such famous criminals as Al Capone, Mickey Cohen, Joseph Dutch uh, Kritzer, and Robert Stroud, Stroud, the famous Birdman of Alcatraz. Follow me, please. The park ranger leads them past the famous visiting rooms, the mess hall, all the way to the solitary confinement area, a cell. This is the cell for solitary confinement that over the years has come to be known as Times Square. Tony and Charlie are at the back of the tour group. So you and uh, Harry, uh, you know. Mm. I don't want to talk about it. With that look, you don't, you don't have to talk about it. The grin alone could give you five to seven years. Tony, get your mind out of the gutter. All you need to know is that she's a sweet, kind, and loving person. And now this is something none of the other tour guides will tell you. In this particular cell block, Machine Gun Kelly had what we call in the prison system a bitch. And one day in a jealous rage, Kelly took a makeshift knife or shiv and cut out his bitch's eyes. Look, what can I tell you? I'm smitten. I'm in deep smit. I don't know. I just don't want to talk about it because then I start analyzing and that's not good for me. Well, good. I think that's good. Just let it happen. Exactly. That's what's going to be different this time. Something strange happens, let it go. It's not my business. Like Ralph. She says Ralph in her sleep. Who's Ralph? I don't know who Ralph is. Moreover, I don't want to know. Good. And as if blinding his bitch wasn't enough retribution for Kelly, the next day he and four of the inmates took turns pissing into the bitch's ocular cavity. Tony and Charlie look at each other. They're a little queasy. Exactly. Tony, I'm happy. Don't let me screw this one up. Interior El Toro in the mission day. They're eating bay burritos. direction here uh did you have a nice date last night ow rose i don't really he disturbed me while i was naked in the shower this morning yeah he stayed over yeah i i didn't mind um charlie and i laughed about it over breakfast that's good um he said you had a great sex last night he did? Yeah. He seems really stuck on you. I hope for you that it lasts. Rose, he's sweet, kind, and loving person. We like each other, but I don't want to think any further. It's taken me a long time to get back to dating, and I want to take things really steady this time. Well, you can trust me not to tell him anything. He was quite happy not to talk about the past. I did a sketch of him. Rose shows the sketch to Harriet. It's good. Um, think I've caught him? The eyes are good. Yeah, Charlie really liked it. 
It's a good likeness. Yeah, boy. I really hope it works out. Rose, I don't want to screw this one up. Exterior Harriet's apartment building day. Charlie enters the building holding a handful of poetry books. He passes a uniform delivery guy coming out. The guy nods and Charlie nods back. Interior Harriet's apartment building continuous. Charlie gets three feet down the hallway, stops in his tracks and heads back to the front door. He opens it and yells to the, to the delivery guy. Hey, uh, Ralph? I'm Gilbert. Shit. Harriet's door moments later. She opens the door enough to see uh, that she's wearing only a blouse that goes below her hips. She looks fantastic. He hands her the poetry books. Charlie, they're beautiful. I'll put them right in water. He follows her inside and puts the books on the burrow. He goes over and kisses her. You look great. I was just getting dressed. What do you think of this skirt? Honestly, I'd leave it off. So then you think I could go to a poetry concert like this? She drops the skirt and stands there. She's fantastic. Let's forget the poetry concert. It's already been nine hours since I last made love to you. Come on. We're meeting your best friend. I want to look good. The second I go to the ladies' room, he's going to tell you what he really thinks of me. He follows her to the bedroom door, constantly trying to kiss her. Come on, Charlie. We have to be there in 15 minutes. 15 minutes? Perfect. She closes the door on his face. Maybe later. I thought of calling you. Ah! Charlie turns on his heel. Rose has appeared out of nowhere. To warn you, Charlie, there are just some things that you should know about Harriet. About Harriet? About her past. I don't want to know. I mean, look, everyone has some skeletons in their past. I only care about the future, not the past. Here's the thing. I may have to tell Harriet. Tell her what? That we're lovers. We're not lovers. I know, and it's a damn shame. Harriet walks in the room fully dressed and fully dazzling. I hope I'm not interrupting. No, not at all. We were just talking about Rose and I met yesterday, so. I heard. Harriet hugs Rose and then stands right next to her. So don't you think we look alike? Oh, we do not. Harriet was always prettier than me and, and a heck of a lot more popular. She always oh. had boyfriends. The only thing I was ever good at, grades. Good grades are good. She's just being kind. Show Charlie one of your photographs, Rose. Rose is a great artist. Oh, no, Harriet, I don't want to. They're not good. You're so modest. If I weren't here to brag for you, I just don't know. Show it to him, Rose. Do it. He turns it over and there's a picture there, a collage of unrelated images put together. And it's beautiful, but it's very abstract, violent perhaps, confused definitely, but he likes it. It's beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you. What is it? I don't know. What do you call it? I don't know. A lot of artists don't like to title their work. They feel it biases the viewer. It's titled. Titled. It's, it's called. I don't know. Charlie looks at it again, then at Rose, then at Harriet. It's all a little bizarre, but in a funny way, he feels for Rose. A hidden talent overshadowed by her sister's beauty. We should get going, Charlie. Thanks, Rose. See you later. Rose, great to see you. We should all go out together sometime. 
the three of us. That would be great. That would be interesting. Charlie and Harriet walk out. Exterior poetry festival night. Charlie and Harriet wait in line with bohemian types and poetry lovers from the suburbs and all walks of life. Directly behind them are two old ladies. The marquee reads poetry festival tonight, Allen Ginsberg. I think you're really going to love Allen Ginsberg. He's great. Oh, I know all about him. Hey, Charlie. Tony is getting out of a cab accompanied by Susan, the girl from Spalletti's coffee house. He approaches Charlie. Star relate. Tony throws his arms wide open and hugs one of the little old ladies on the other side of Charlie. You must be Harriet. I've heard a lot about you. This is Harriet. Oh, sorry. Oh, of course. I apologize. Charlie described you as much older and heavier. Oh, he did. Thank you, Tony. This is my best friend. And this is Susan. Charlie, you remember her from Uncle Giuseppe's? Yes, I do. You're funny. Hang on, sorry, my script keeps flipping out on me. Uh, she giggles. The girls start inside. Tony lags back with Charlie. I gave Susan one night. Interior, <laughs> interior poetry festival night. Allen Ginsberg is on stage. He's brilliant. Tony, Charlie, and Harriet are all amused. Susan is bored stiff. Charlie is looking at Tony. Tony glances over at Susan and gives Charlie an oh well look. Then he looks at Harriet and nods in approval of her. Exterior fisherman's wharf night. The four of them walk along the wharf. Charlie is at one of those arcade games where you throw bean bags at the puppets and try and knock them down. Charlie knocks two down. One more and you can get your pick. You do it. No, Charlie, I'm the worst. Come on, you'll be great. The arcade man turns around to watch. Harriet winds up and throws the beanbag directly into his neck. Hey! Sorry. I told you, Charlie. No, you're okay. You're just having control problems. They both start laughing. He puts his arm around her. In the background, the wounded arcade man is being led away by a coworker. They continue down the boardwalk stand in front of a house of horrors. It looks somewhat run down, and Harriet looks questioningly at Charlie. I know this is really, really cheesy, but in a way, this is one of the places in San Francisco I'm most proud of. Yeah? Let's go in. Tony nods agreement. Susan looks bored. They go inside the House of Horrors. It's as low rent as Charlie described. The keeper of the threshold, so described in a poorly written sign, is an overweight man in his late 20s, wearing jeans and a denim jacket and a little bit of scary makeup. He looks like a roadie for the band Kiss. He stands at a podium smoking and reading a paper. As Charlie, Tony, Harriet, and Susan pass the threshold keeper, he takes a casual drag of his cigarette, lets out a little smoke, and with zero commitment utters. Boo. Interior Wax Museum Day. Harriet and Charlie enter Bill's Wax Museum. The owner of the Wax Museum greets them. Hi, I'm Bill. Welcome to my Wax Museum. They walk over to the exhibits. There are exhibits of Abraham Lincoln, Michael Jackson, and Dolly Parton. As they look more closely, they notice that the faces are exactly the same as Bill's. They laugh. Exterior street night. Pouring rain, thunder. Charlie and Harriet, wrapped in each other's arms, are walking through the rain. I feel so safe with you right now. You're never going to leave me, are you? I feel like I could be here forever. Cut to a tight shot of rain hitting Charlie's panic-stricken face. Match dissolved too. The reflection of rain on Charlie's panic-stricken face. Pull back to see Charlie in bed. He lies awake on his side, his back up to Harriet's. She's sound asleep, suddenly. Ralph! No! Ralph! Charlie sighs, then just shrugs and tries to fall asleep. What can he do? Fade in, interior Charlie's parents' apartment hallway night. Charlie and Harriet wait outside his parents' door. Well, this is it. It'll be fine. They enter the door. Interior, Charlie's parents' apartment, night. We again move along the hallway. We pass the Scottish Wall of Fame, Scotty from Star Trek, Sir Walter Scott, Sir Harry Lauder, Sheena Easton, Al Pacino, Billy Connolly. Then the camera backtracks to Pacino, where it holds momentarily. Mom, Dad, we're here. May comes up wearing a fancy country and Western outfit. Oh, Charlie, this is the wee Harriet. Oh, she's beautiful. 
Thank you. She's so sweet. I hope we keep her. Stuart, come out here, YouTube. When he comes up, Stuart is wearing only a shirt with his boxer shorts. Ah, it's the wee Harriet. Stuart, put your pants on. Hold your horses! Heed! Pants! William comes around the corner with his pants. Dad, what's Al Pacino doing on the Scottish Wall of Fame? That's for Tony. So, Charlie tells me you're a butcher. Let's talk meat. Dad, no one wants to talk shop. Especially butcher shop. Come here. Stuart gets him in a half Nelson. Ah, oh, Dad, Dad, I have a back zit. Man, it kills. Charlie struggles to free himself. Stuart turns to greet Harriet. As he reaches out his hand, totally instinctively, Harriet grabs Stuart's hand and twists it behind his back. Charlie is startled as his date has just gotten stirred into a half Nelson. I'm sorry. I, I, I just, uh, you just surprised me. I'm sorry. I like this one, Charlie. She's quite a filly. I'm, I'm really embarrassed. Don't be embarrassed about having a good, strong butcher's grab. Do you link your own sausage? Huh? Oh, ignore him. Come have a look at the, some photos of Charlie when he was a wee Come on, don't start with the pictures. Ah, oh, Charlie, lighten up. You've got to pickle up your ass. I'm going to use the bathroom. You'd be okay with him alone? Fine. Don't worry about it. Hurry. They smile as he leaves the room. Make sure there's paper, Charlie! Charlie picks up the pace, scared of what he might hear next. Make sure you leave the seat down. Ma, just show her the pictures. And light a match! He always leaves the seat up. He's got to learn. Interior bathroom at parents, night. He closes the door and shakes his head. What can he do? Those are his parents. On the wall opposite the toilet is a well-used dartboard with pictures of the Queen Mother and Colonel Sanders. Hooked to the magazine caddy is a small container of darts. Interior of the living room. May excitedly shows Harriet family photo albums. This is Charlie with his uncle Eki. He's a policeman in Canada. And our cousins Ruth and Jack. He's just got a restraining order from his wife. She's a lovely girl. This is Billy. He's a member of the parliament. He drinks. What a nice family you have. Charlie in the bathroom. He doesn't seem in any hurry to leave either. He listens through the door to Harriet, enthusiastically looking through old photos. Charlie glances down at a stack of National Enquirers on the magazine rack. He flips through a few. He sees one of the absurd headlines, alien UFO sex diet. Charlie shakes his head. Charlie was the cutest baby. You okay in there, Charlie? You didn't fall in, did you? Jesus. Charlie then looks down at another article in the Enquirer and reads, who's next for Mrs. X, the honeymoon killer? It's the article about Mrs. X the axe murderer who kills her husbands on their honeymoons and then marries again under a different identity. In the living room, May is quickly flipping through a photo album, pointing out pictures of relatives as she goes. I can't believe the resemblance between you and Charlie, Miss McKenzie. Interior, Charlie in the bathroom. With Harriet speaking in the background, Charlie continues reading, now absorbed in the article about the three victims. You have the same smile. It's so incredible. Victim number one the German martial arts expert from Miami. Victim number two, the lounge singer from Atlantic City. Victim number three, the San Francisco plumber, Ralph Elliott. Interior Charlie's car, night, close up on Harriet's face. Sitting in the front seat of Charlie's car, smiling, content, a great meal, a great night out with Charlie and a nice evening with his parents. Slowly pan across the front seat to Charlie, a nervous, anxious, what the hell am I getting myself into look on his face. So that was some move you put on my dad there. Did you study karate or? No, not officially. I dated a guy for a while who ran a studio. Oh, the martial arts expert, the North South guy. Here in San Francisco? Actually, Miami. He looks straight ahead, trying to act unfazed, but he's very phased. His expression is covered in it. Was that before Atlantic City or after? Oh, 
that was years ago. Atlantic City was recent. I didn't care for Atlantic City. Town full of gamblers and lounge singers. He keeps driving. Interior police station, day. Charlie walks through the precinct towards Tony's office, holding the National Enquirer in his hand. Hey, Charlie. Is Tony back there? The sergeant nods and Charlie heads back to the office. Uh, Interior police station, day. Okay, Tony. Do you have the uh, K673 form completed yet? Did the uh, street vendor incident on Powell Street? Yes, Captain. Tony, do you mind my saying that you seem a little down? Captain, it's about my work. Uh, about being a policeman. Tony, if there's anything wrong, I'm here to listen. I know, and that's what's irritating. You're too nice. You're too nice? Yes, you're my captain, for God's sakes. You should be constantly on my case, like the captain of Starsky and Hutch. Once a week, you should routinely haul my ass into your office, accuse me of being a maverick, and complain to me like you're sick or tired defending my screwball antics to the commissioner. Well, as you know, Tony, I don't report to a commissioner. I report to a committee. Some of them were appointed, some elected, and a remainder of co-opted on a biannual basis. A quorum of... Uh, police work should be, uh, be all running around. Uh, following up crazy hunches that turn out to be right. Um, going out on a limb. Well, Tony, I've never seen it that way. For me, police work is all about following procedure and remaining accountable for the general public. Captain, well, when I joined the police force, I thought I was going to be Serpico, and, and unfortunately, I ended up being Toma. I would have settled for Beretta. It's interesting, Tony. I'm perturbed that you should be so disillusioned. Charlie enters. Hey, Tony, I got to talk to you. Oh, hello, Charlie. Look, uh, I'm in the way here. You guys probably have something you want to talk about. And Tony, if you still got stuff you want to sort out, please, you know where the suggestion box is. The captain exits. Nice guy. Hey, what's up? I have doubts about being a cop again. It's not, it's not like how it is on the cop shows. All I do is fill out papers and reports. Let me get this straight. Your captain hasn't threatened you to have you up on charges so fast you won't know what hit you? No. He's never once said to me that he was going to throw the book at me so hard I'll knock my ass from here till Tuesday. Anyway, what's up? Talk? Charlie pulls out the National Enquirer, the one on Mrs. X, the honeymoon killer. Have you heard of this case? Mrs. X, she murder, murders her husbands on their honeymoons and then changes her identity and marries again. I never heard of it, so what? Curious, that's all. I read about it and I think I'm dating Mrs. X. <sighs> Two words, Charlie. Get therapy. They have doctors that deal specifically with this illness. Everything's adding up, Tony. One of the victims was a martial arts expert. Last night at dinner, she put a martial arts move on my dad. Oh, there were about 20,000 people in San Francisco with martial arts experts. So I arrest all of them too, hmm? If they also say Ralph in their sleep, I think it'd be a good start. Ralph Elliott, a plumber from San Francisco, missing since his honeymoon. You're just getting scared, like, like, like the dream. You feel Harry could be, be the one. So you start to suspect her of things because deep down, you're scared that if she is the one, you'll marry and marriage to you, is death. Hey, don't analyze my dreams, okay? They're my dreams. Analyze your own dreams. I'm not a marrying thing, Tony. It's a, it's not a marrying thing, Tony. It's a murdering thing. Harriet lived in Atlantic City, right? Well, so did this guy, right around the same time she left town. Uh, Larry Leonard, a crooner, a crooner who uh, made a name for himself for being able to sing in, sing in six different languages, the song Only You. Does she know the song, Only You? I don't know. It hasn't come up yet. Charlie, move past it. You're, you're running your life by the National Enquirer. What? It's the fifth highest circulating newspaper in the United States. Mrs. X, please, look it up. Computer room at police station minutes later. Charlie and Tony are in the back with Kathy, a stocky black woman in uniform who works in the files department. There's no record of any deaths. All three of these guys were reported missing around the time of their honeymoon, but so were their wives. No pictures of any of the brides. For all we know, they just packed up and moved away. And Ralph Elliott, too? Charlie, you, you're thinking about three guys over a seven-year span. That's hardly news. No deaths. Elopement in this state as of this day is still not a week. Yeah, well, murder is 
And this article says that these men were murdered by the same woman. Mr. McKenzie, we found that most National Enquirer articles are actually based on our own police reports. They take the facts and fabricate the story around them. Mm -hmm. It's true, Charlie. You got to realize that. I mean, personally, I would lie to you, but Kathy has this crazy notion of, uh, was it telling the truth? You feel better now? I guess so. It's just, if I had a photo of Harriet, I could show it to the relatives of, or friends of Mrs. X's victims to identify her. Charlie, listen to me. There is no Mrs. X. Drop it. Kaput, okay? Interior hallway, Harriet's apartment, evening. Charlie knocks on the door. Rose answers. You're back. <laughs> but Harriet's not here. Maybe I could wait. Sure, that'll be fine. She then starts to slowly close the door. He props it open with his hand. Inside, I was hoping... I'm glad you asked. I didn't want to be so forward. I mean, if you're waiting inside, then you feel obligated to entertain me and keep me up the conversation just to be polite. And, and really, your head might be totally elsewhere. And then there's the chance that you would really want to talk. And then it's me who'd be busy and on an attempt to be not to be rude. And I sit there and listen to some story that you don't really want to tell. And I don't really have time to hear, you know? I couldn't agree with you more. I think about a lot of things. Look, if you have work to do, you go right ahead. I mean, to tell you the truth, I'd, I'd love to see your work. Okay, uh, what would you like me to do? No, I don't want to see you work. I was talking about your work, your photographs. That one that I saw was so wonderful and... Harriet's far more talented than I am. Well, I'm sure it's so subjective anyway, and Rose, show me your photos. Close on photographs, there are two kinds. Beautiful travel pictures and very erotic black and white portraits of young men and women, all with a slight sadomasochistic quality. At the bottom of every photo, it says season's greetings. Hey, these are some interesting photos here. Very impressive. Nice shots of Sausalito and some good bondage shots. Uh, but there, a lot of people wouldn't think to mix the two subjects, but they're really natural together. Hey, you wouldn't happen to have any pictures of Harriet by chance, would you? Oh, well, I don't think she'd want to do this sort of, you know. Um. No, 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 not that. Uh, just in general, some photos. Any little snapshot would do. I doubt I have any. Harriet hates being photographed. The sound of a key in the door as Harriet enters the apartment. Rose, did I see Charlie's car out in front? We're in here, Harriet. What are you guys doing? Oh, nothing. Just looking through some of Rose's work. Charlie wanted a photo of you. And that, that too. Why of me, Charlie? Well, sentimental reasons. Something to remind me of you when we're not together. She takes him in her arms and gives him a knee buckling kiss. There, can you remember that? I'm sorry, you guys. I don't know why my script jumped all the way. Okay, it's just, I was gonna give one to my parents too and another time would be fine. It's hardly a matter of life and death. TV set playing the evening news. On the news tonight, regarding a Beverly Hills jeweler, Morris Cohen, who died last week, police are now suspecting that Morris's partner, Lawrence Sachs, may have murdered him with an untraceable poison. Reveal that we are in interior Charlie's bedroom night. Charlie is on a Stairmaster as Harriet walks in wearing a robe. The TV is on in the background. Where you been? Downstairs. I have a surprise for you. Great. 
just want to do a quick 20 minutes on the Stairmaster before bed. Harriet drops her robe, and from over her shoulder, we see that Charlie prefers what he sees to working out. I'll do 40 tomorrow. I got something much healthier for you than that. She pulls out a milkshake from behind her back. What is it? It's a health shake. Eggs, malt, cinnamon, oranges. It's great. I mixed it up downstairs. The TV set continues on about poisons and poisoners. Charlie glances at it. Poisoning has become the second leading method of murder in recent years. Dude. Charlie watches the TV looking a bit disturbed. Harriet offers him the shake. Oh, uh, look, I'm full dinner and... Uh, You'll like it, Charlie. No, really, thanks. You won't try it? I, I spent 20 minutes making it. He takes it, lifts it to his mouth, then puts it on the table. Um, smells good. Maybe I'll take some to the office tomorrow. I'm gonna brush my teeth. Beer back. Charlie goes into the bathroom. In Charlie's bathroom, Harriet comes into the bathroom and lays the empty glass down on the counter. I'm gonna take a quick shower. Charlie notices the empty glass on the counter. Harriet, where did the shake go? What do you care? I drank it. You could have at least tried it. You make me feel so bad sometimes. Charlie, I, I don't know why. With her in the shower, he sneaks back into the bedroom and checks the trash can, nothing. Then he runs around the bed to the other trash can, nothing. He looks thoroughly confused as she enters the bedroom wearing a towel. She takes the towel off as she slips underneath the covers. He gets into bed next to her, she gives him a kiss. Sorry, I'm a little sensitive. You didn't wanna drink my milkshake, so what, right? Regarding the murder between two partners, we talked to toxicologist Dr. Show on the issue. Charlie and Harriet are watching the news show. Dr. Show is patched in via the Anchorman's closed circuit TV. Doctor, is it possible that one could be poisoned with no trace at all? Uh, certainly. There are plants that grow very commonly in our own backyard that could easily be fermented into poison. Take, for instance, the... Harriet, why don't we shut the light off? Really? And how easy, uh, how easy is it to do that? Scarily enough, quite simple. You merely take the... Maybe we should turn the light back on. Yeah, that's better. Charlie, what's the matter? Nothing. Charlie... Well, it's just... The TV. You can't even watch the news these days without getting depressed. I know, Charlie. It's not just that. Look at the things people are doing. Partners killing each other. I mean, you hear a story like that and... Who can you really trust these days? What do you mean? It's like, you ever stood with someone on the edge of a cliff or the edge of a subway platform and you think just for a split second, what have I pushed him? Well, I don't really take the subway ever, so. Charlie turns over on his side. She cuddles up behind him. I'm just making a point of how many times we trust people with our lives. I mean, look at us. If you didn't trust me, you wouldn't, would never be able to just fall asleep. Why do you say that? Look at you, you're sleeping. Look, look how vulnerable you are. I mean, I could do anything at that point. What could you do? Anything, you're lying on your side asleep. I could stick a needle in your ear. Ah. I was just making a point about our good relationship we have. Gosh, good night, sweetheart. He looks very uneasy. She kisses him and shuts off the light. The moon gives the room an eerie glow. Well, good night. Good night. She doesn't close her eyes. He's scared to close his. Pause. Well, good night. Good night. They both look over at each other. Uh, she closes her eyes. He takes a deep breath and then closes his eyes and covers his ear with his hand. Interior BART platform day. Charlie is on the crowded platform. Next to him is an old lady with a lot of shopping bags. 
Three kids on skateboards whiz by and accidentally knock bags out of her hands. Cat toys and cans of cat food go everywhere. Charlie bends down and starts to help her gather her stuff. Thank you very much, young man. I gotta get all this stuff back to my children. Your children? When I say my children, I mean my cats. You see, my children moved out years ago, so all I've got is my cats. I have over 100 of them. That's a lot of cats. Charlie. Charlie looks up and sees Harriet waving to him from the subway stairs. He waves back and motions, I'll be there in a second, and continues to help the old lady. She watches from the stairs. You see this red toy? That's for the captain. He's finicky. And this blue one? That's for Marco Polo. Two train headlights are seen off in the distance. Do you have a name for all of your cats? Oh, yes. Charlie glances over at Harriet, who slowly makes her way down the platform towards him. Let me see, there's Winston Churchill, Rita Sovine, Thomas Edison, Andrew Carnegie. The train is getting closer and closer, and so is Harriet. He's Scottish. Harriet moves forward a step, Charlie moves back a step. Isn't he Irish? As Harriet seems to get closer, Charlie continues to back up, picking up cat toys. Charlie realizes he has nowhere else to turn. So he sidesteps down the platform, never stopping his conversation with the lady. Actually, he was Scottish. Trust me, I know these things. Harriet is moving in on him. Charlie steadily makes his way down the platform, feigning accidentally kicking cat food down the platform. The old lady is unsure what is going on. She tries to keep up with him. Now that you say it, he was Scotch. Charlie runs out of platform. Harriet is very close to him. The train is closer, so is Harriet. Charlie lets out a scream. No! Charlie is standing at the edge of the platform. Harriet is a good six or seven feet away as the train passes by. Charlie is safe. People are all staring at Charlie curiously, including Harriet and the old lady. Charlie is embarrassed. No! Scotch is a drink. Scots are people. <laughs> Sorry, that was that just always bugged me. No one knows what's going on. I'm sorry, I didn't know it meant so much to you. Hi, Harriet. Exterior San Francisco Chronicle Building Day. Interior Chronicle Announcements Desk. We see a long desk with different signs that read births, deaths, and marriages. We find Charlie at the marriage counter. Yes, sir. Can I help you? I'd like to put in, put in an announcement of my parents' 45th wedding anniversary. Sure, it's four fifty per word, and you've got a choice of standard or bold. Bold, and here, I've written it out. Charlie looks over to the deaths counter. He overhears two obituary assistants having a conversation. Hi, Frank. Busy week? Yeah, I only got two. <laughs> I've been dead around here. Both assistants laugh. Charlie is mildly bemused. Yeah, I hear this one guy, a tourist. He had a heart attack on a cable car. Looks like he left his heart in San Francisco. Hey, that's a real person you're talking about. You're right. Sorry. Yeah, well, is this uh, other guy, Elliot, uh, Ralph, a plumber. He disappeared four months ago. Your body found in a sewer. I guess he took his work too seriously. And his life went down the drain. Did they mention anything about his wife? You're right. I feel bad. Point taken. I mean, these aren't real. These are real people we're talking about. No, I'm serious. Did he mention the wife? You made your point. I was wrong to make a joke about a person's life. I really want to know about his wife. Okay, you win. I'm a bad, bad person. Frank, right. take it easy. Oh, no, he's right. I'm for shit. I am one insensitive asshole. Is there any mention of the wife at all? No, no, there's no mention of the wife. You happy? Charlie exits. Exterior Chronicle announcement office day. Charlie stands outside the announcement office, terrified. Interior meets of the world. Harriet is talking to a customer. Hi. I'm sorry. I think you're a terrific woman. I just don't think we should see each other anymore. She moves around to Charlie. She lifts his chin so that he's looking directly into her eyes. Why not? And tell me the truth. Truth? Okay. The truth is... 
She's so close to him and so very beautiful. It's distracting. The truth is, the truth is I'm afraid that you're, a, you're going to laugh. I don't think so. Okay. The truth is that I'm afraid you're going to ki leave me. I'm going to cleave you. What does that mean? Leave me, not cleave me, re reject me. And, and so I decided to take it into my own hands and get it over with by. Rejecting me. Purely preventative. It's not anything you've done. I know that. So why are you leaving me? Harriet, maybe I'm not meant to be in a relationship. A single tear runs down her cheek. She brushes it away quickly. I never wanted to hurt you. You haven't. At least you left early on. So that's it then. I've got a lot of work to do. Now, where were we? Charlie goes. Interior, Spalletti's coffee house night. Charlie lies on the bar, head down. Tony rushes in, looks around and sees Charlie. Two hours and four minutes. Tony, I need you. And two hours and four minutes later, you show up. Sorry, I know it was irresponsible to stay at the drug bus until it was over, but what happened? I'm gonna tell you, but when I do, just say nothing. Just don't judge me. Just be my friend, okay? Fine, okay. I broke up with Harriet. You're an asshole. What's your point? I'm sorry, I just... Why? Tony, she's a killer. The... Everything. But nothing's proven. The only thing you're actually sure she did so far is she treated you like a king. Oh, no. I don't know, Tony. I just... Besides, everyone has something going on with them. I mean, you can't find everything in one person. I mean, she's bright, she's funny, she's independent. So maybe, and it's really just a maybe, she kills her husband. Marriage is, marriage is give or take. You take the good with the bad. Interior, Charlie's bedroom, middle of the night. Charlie lies in bed. He's writing in his journal. He stares out into space. Inspired, he writes, angle on the journal. Don't be disillusioned by the Scottish sun as he flies in bat-like unison. Charlie pauses a moment to reflect, then writes, angle on the journal, untrusting, unknowing, unloving. Charlie thinks of something else and writes, angle on the journal, this poem sucks. His hand reaches across and scratches it out. Exterior height, Ashbury Street, day. Charlie is exiting a vintage record store. Suddenly he finds himself face to face with Sherry. She's accompanied by a handsome young man. Hey, Charlie. Hi. How are you doing? Good, huh? I'm okay. This is Michael. Michael, this is Charlie McKenzie. Oh, I know. Why don't you two talk? I'm gonna go over here and buy some magazines. He walks over to a magazine stand. That good looking Andy can read. I'm teaching him. I heard you have a new girlfriend. We broke up. There were problems. Problems? Difficulties. Let me guess. She's a murderer. For a moment, Charlie is too stunned to respond. Then... Uh, why did you just say that? <laughs> what else is left? Interior Charlie's bedroom, early evening. He's on the Stairmaster, stepping very lethargically. The telephone rings. He goes to answer. Hello? Hello? Not that it matters anymore, but I thought you should know. Someone just turned themselves in for the murder of Ralph Elliot. Really? She confessed to the other murders? Just the plumber so far, but she'll come along. A little old lady from Pacific Heights, uh, said he overcharged her on a leaky, leaking sink. Really? Leaky sink, huh? Anyway, crime to stop. Gotta go. I'll, I'll catch you later. Tony hangs up. Charlie stops pedaling on the bike. Now he really feels like shit. Harriet's not a killer. Sherry's not a cheater. He races out of the bedroom. Moments later, he appears, puts on a pair of pants over his exercise shorts, then races out the door again. 
Exterior, interior, Charlie's car, early evening. Charlie races along towards Harriet's house. Exterior, Harriet's apartment door, day. He races up to the door and starts to bang and knock and ring. Harriet, it's me, Charlie. Go away, Charlie. I've got to talk to you because I miss you and I made a mistake. And if you give me another chance, I'll, I'll change. I will, I promise. I'll get help or therapy or, yeah, that'll be great. Therapy, even twice a week. I'll, I'll check with my insurance to see if I'm covered, but forget that. Harriet. The chain opens on the door. You really hurt me. I'll make it up to you. Can we at least talk? Sure, talk. Rose steps up behind Charlie. Hi, Charlie. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Trust your first instincts, Charlie. You never do. It's your big mistake. That in your haircut. Once again, baffled by Rose, Charlie touches his hair. He shakes it off and looks Harriet right in the eye. I don't want to lose you. You didn't lose me. You rejected me. I'm unrejecting you. How do I know you won't reject me again? I love you. I love you. But you blew it, Charlie. You blew it. She goes into the house. Charlie stands there dejected. He knows he's blown. <laughs> Interior Harriet's apartment, night. Harriet is doing a load of laundry consisting of bloodied work clothes. Suddenly she can hear the sound of music very loudly. Annoyed, she goes out her front door to tell her neighbors off. Just as she's about to knock on the door, she realizes it's not the source of the music. At that moment, her neighbor, who's a stewardess, comes out in night clothes. I don't mean to be a pain, but I'm in a stewardess and I have an early flight out in the morning. Can you please keep your music down? I thought it was coming from here. But someone keeps shouting your name over and over. Puzzled, Harriet rushes back to her own balcony. In exterior, Harriet's apartment, balcony, night. Harriet rushes out and smiles as she sees the source of the noise. Charlie serenades Harriet in the street below, accompanied by a trumpeter with a mute, uh, a double bass player and a guy on a snare. Harriet, Harriet, hard-hearted, harbinger of haggis, beautiful, bemused, bellicose butcher, untrusting, unknowing, unloving. He wants you back. He screams into the night air like a fireman going to a window that has no fire except the passion of his heart. I am lonely. It's really hard. This poem sucks. A crowd has gathered in the street and spectators group on their balconies. They break out into applause. Charlie proudly takes the applause and bows to Harriet. She throws him a flower. He's won her back. Interior bathtub, Harriet's apartment night. Romantic with candles surrounding the tub. Harriet and Charlie are bathing together. Whenever, wherever one of them moves, the water extinguishes a candle and Charlie lights it. This is keeping him pretty busy. I've been there for almost a year. I only planned on staying with her for a few weeks, but she gets upset every time I say I'm moving. You were close to kids? I pretty much raised her. You know the scene, depressed mother, withdrawn father. My dad was a photographer too. Really? He hated it. Trudging off to those weddings every Saturday night, other people's celebrations, he called it. He said sometimes they didn't even offer him a glass of soda. He had a small studio and every year at Christmas, he'd take a photo of me and Rose and put it in the window on a little card that said, Seating, season's greeting, awful pictures. It's like I could see his pain in my face. Anyway, me and my sister worked with our childhood issues and in different ways. She became a photographer and I became phobic about having my picture taken it's quite a family where are they now your parents dead car accident there's a ring at the door uh harriet it's for you interior harriet's living room charlie comes out of the bathroom in a robe charlie 
I want you to meet a friend of mine. Say hi to Ralph. Ralph? A plain looking lady in her thirties. Ralph is sitting by the window. Oh, like Ralph, the lady carpenter in Green Acres. This is Charlie. I love you. It's nice to meet you. Nice, it's more than nice. It's great to meet you. It's fantastic to meet you. I just, I can't tell you how glad I am. Ralph, really, I am. Well, thank you. I've heard a lot of nice things about you too. And he rushes over to hug her. Oh, Ralphie, I love you. Swept up in his enthusiasm, his towel falls off. Harriet is shocked, but amused. I'll leave you guys alone. Uh, have a great time. Charlie realizes he's naked. His arms are still wrapped around Ralph. I'm naked, aren't I? Why, yes, you are. I should really get dressed now. He hurriedly puts his towel back on and bolts to the bedroom door. Just before he enters, he pauses and turns to Ralph. He leaves. Friendly guy? Cut to a kitchen door opens and Charlie's mother May shoulders her way through the door, carrying a happy anniversary cake with a big 45 written on it. Pull back to reveal we're in Charlie's parents' apartment night. May and Stuart's 45-year anniversary party. Uncle Angus is at the piano playing happy anniversary as Charlie's parents, all their friends, and Harriet all sit around the piano singing. Happy, happy anniversary, anniversary to you. To you. Uh, Etc. The song ends. May and Stuart blow out the candles. Okay, everyone, come and get a piece of the cake and some milk. Hey, Dad, I got an anniversary present for you. Stuart looks up and Charlie gets him in a headlock and pins him to the ground. I'm proud of you, son. I'm proud of you. I want to propose a toast to my wife. 45 years ago today, May and I got married. Some of you were there. Some of you weren't born yet. Some of you are now dead. But we both said I do, and we haven't agreed on a single thing since. But I'm glad I married you, May, because it could have been worse. And besides, I still love you. They kiss and everyone applauds. Uncle Angus breaks into Stand By Your Man. May and Stuart start to dance. Charlie looks at another young couple who are touched by this sincere display of love. He looks over at Harriet. Stuart and May feed each other cake. Charlie approaches Harriet. Harriet, I want to talk to you. Boy, you really made some impression with Ralph. She can't get over you. I'm just so happy for you to have friends like Ralph. What a great friend to have. Is everything all right, Charlie? You're perspiring. Harriet, marry me. What? I want to have a wedding with you. No. Please? I don't know, Charlie. It's so good like it is. Why don't we just live together first? Because I love you and I want you to marry me and be with me for 45 years. I want you to have my children and I want to have your children. I know that sounds like a lot of children and they might not all get along, but I'm finally ready to trust you and to make a commitment. Marry me, Harriet, please. Be my wife. Harriet flinches slightly at the word wife, but Charlie is too wrapped up in the moment to notice. Stuart addresses the group. I'd like to thank Charlie for throwing us this party. I hope someday you have some great, the same great 45 years that we've had. People clap and smile. Harriet looks at Charlie. He has tears in his eyes. Yes. At first, it doesn't register. Then... You will? She smiles. Let's get married, Charlie. They kiss. Harriet, come here a minute. I want you and Uncle Angus to play a song together. Harriet and Charlie kiss one last time, and she goes to the piano. Charlie stays in the corner, and Tony comes over. Hey, sorry I'm so late. What's happening? Nothing. Nothing at all. Just two little things. That woman over there in the corner, she's Harriet's friend. And her name is Ralph. No shit. Secondly, 
that woman over there, that's Harriet. And we're getting married. Fantastic. What did I tell you? She's a great girl. And the last thing in the world she'd be is a murderer. And then Harriet begins singing at the piano. Only you can make this world seem right. Only you can make this darkness light. Tony and Charlie look at each other. Only you. Then Charlie looks at his bride with confidence. He walks over and joins her. She sings to him. It's a moment. Interior jewelry store, day. Charlie and Harriet pick out a diamond ring. Interior travel agency. Charlie and Harriet point to brochures of the different cities they could go to on their honeymoon. They decide on a picture of the Dry Creek Lodge in Oregon. Interior doctor's office. They're getting their blood tests back. Harriet looks at hers casually. Charlie is nervous. Reluctantly, he opens the file and looks at it. He's pleased with the results and does a victory dance. Exterior, Scottish Presbyterian Church establishing. Interior, the church. Charlie and Harriet are being married. Harriet is in a beautiful wedding gown. Charlie is wearing a kilt. Tony is the best man. He also wears a kilt. Stuart, also kilted. Uh, May, the whole family, along with 100 well-wishers, are in attendance. The Scottish minister presides. Rose is also in a kilt. Now, Mr. Mackenzie. If you will take this woman to be your wife through thick and thin, for better or for worse, please say, I do. I do. Now, Harriet, if you will take this man through good times and bad, forever and ever, as your husband, please say, I do. Harriet starts to speak, but right before the words come out, she stares into Charlie's eyes and stops. Charlie looks nervous. So does the Scottish minister. So does Tony. So does everyone. I do. Now, Charlie, kiss the beautiful bride. Charlie and Harriet kiss. We can see, though Charlie can't, Harriet has a strange, unsure expression on her face. Tony notices it, though, and can't figure it out. Let's get pissed! <laughs> the wedding march kicks in, being played by a drunken Scotsman on bagpipes. Uh, interior reception hall. A Scottish accord accordionist and a drummer play Scotland the Brave. Some older Scottish aunties are clapping and hooting loudly along with the tune. Some young girl cousins in traditional Scottish costume dance the sword uh, and dance along to Scotland the Brave. We pass the buffet, which we see is catered by meats of the world. Then we pass a very drunken steward in a heated discussion with four other people. You know, Golden Gate Park was designed by a Scotsman, McLaren, which is who McLaren Park was named after. The others agree heartedly. Uh, May and Tony are dancing. May is dancing uncomfortably close. She keeps sliding her hand down to his ass, which he then has to move back to his shoulder. Then we come to William, who's reluctantly at the children's table. All his little cousins are queuing up for a chance to feel his head. We find Charlie in a corner. One of the hooting Scottish aunties is trying to get him to have another scotch. Oh, Charlie, get this down your neck. I am Molly. I, if I have another one, I'll end up underneath the table with my kilt over my head. Tony joins them. Where's Harriet? I don't know. Oh, there she is. She's in the corner by herself looking weird and ominous. She has enough food in front of her for three people. She eats ravenously and incessantly. Charlie goes over to her. A little hungry, were you? At that moment, a flash goes off. Harriet looks up angrily. What are you... Then she realizes it's uh, Rose. She's calmed down and smiles. Charlie looks at her a little peculiarly, but Harriet regains her composure. Sorry, the flash just... The band kicks into a new dance. A young boy comes up to the bagpipe man with a shot of whiskey and whispers into his ear. The bagpipe man stops the song, downs the whiskey, and then breaks into Rod Stewart's If You Think I'm Sexy. From across the room, we hear Stewart singing. If you want my body, I'm just think I'm sexy. Come on, baby, let me know. Stuart gives the bagpiper the thumbs up. The young people in the room start to jam, and then one by one, the other guests start getting into the swing of things. The bagpipe man continues playing. It's clear that he's far too drunk to play. He slowly keels over drunk, and as he falls over face first, he lands on his bagpipes. The bagpipes let out an atonal deflating sound like the last dying throes of a tortured animal. The bagpipe wail extends into the next scene. Oh, we've got a piper down. Exterior high above coast, day. Eh? 
Wait till you see this place, Harriet. Interior Charlie's car, day. They drive along the beautiful coast. Harriet is still eating. They're listening to Teenage Fan Club. This is Teenage Fan Club. They're from Scotland. They're great. We'll have the whole lodge to ourselves, practically. I can't wait, Charlie. I wish you could be me, so you know how great it feels to be with you. It sounds wonderful. You think that would be a good line for a poem? Honestly, it sounds a little hallmark. Yeah, it's a little seals and croft. I have a habit of sabotaging relationships, and there were a million times during me and you that I could have blown this. I just thank God that I didn't. Interior police station. Uh, Tony is at his desk. The captain kicks open the door, knocking Tony's feet off the desk. The captain is now dressed in suspenders, a loosened tie, and a shirt with pit stains. Okay, Splinetti. I got word from upstairs you're poking your nose in the Ralph Elliott case. Yes, Captain. Don't yes, Captain me, Splinetti. You're out of line. That's strictly homicide. Captain, I got this friend. Uh... Friend? Yeah, we all got friends, Splinetti. I'm warning you, stay away from this one. Back off, Italian boy. You're getting too close to this one. Captain, I know what I'm doing. Uh, trust me. What's the news? Can't believe I'm doing this. But that girl who, conf uh, who confessed to Ralph Elliott's murder also confessed to some other murders. I knew she would. I knew it. Yeah, apparently she also confessed to killing Abe Lincoln, Julius Caesar, and Warren G. Harding. She's a nut, Splinetti. Oh, my God. I got to go. Yeah, screw this one up, Splinetti. And you'll be writing parking tickets for the rest of your days. I won't let you down, Captain. Tony exits for a beat, then pokes his head in the doorway. Much better, Captain. You think so? Yeah, it was too mean. Th th thank you very much. Exterior police station day. Tony hurries to his car. Exterior gas station along the coast. They stop at a gas station with a small mini mart. As Charlie is filling the tank, he notices Harriet slipping the key out of the ignition before she walks to the mini mart for more food. You want anything? Lamb chops, cream spinach, stuffed tomatoes, and a Hershey bar. Harriet arrives at the little Ma and Pa type mini mart and smiles to Charlie. If they don't have all that, I'll just take the Hershey bar. Exterior Charlie's apartment building. Uh, day. Tony stands at the door, buzzing the buzzer to no response. Interior Charlie's car, early evening. They're still driving along the coast. Charlie is eating his Hershey bar. Harriet's eyes are becoming a bit glazed now. Her movement's a little static. She keeps looking behind them and out the window. What do you keep looking behind us for? Is someone following you, or? They were. I think they're gone. What do you mean, they were? The gas station guy. I, th I thought he was chasing us for a while, but I guess he stopped. The gas station guy? Why would the gas station guy chase us? I don't know, Charlie. I guess we're not paying. What do you mean, not paying? You didn't pay him for the gas? I, I forgot to pay. I didn't want to be away from you any longer. So you just left? Yes, and you're an accomplice. He stops mid-bite on his Hershey bar. He's confused. I'm not sure I understand. Look, Charlie, don't you get it? We're a team. I can play that game. I'll get the next gas station. Like Bonnie and Clyde. He and Bonnie continue on the winding road and pass a sign that reads Dry Creek Lodge, 40 miles. Interior hallway, Harriet's apartment, day. Tony knocks, no answer. He picks the lock and enters. Interior living room, uh, day. Rose is tied up and lying in a pool of blood. Tony stops for a beat, draws his gun, and slowly walks over to her. Just as he gets there, a shutter clicks. Oh, hi! Oh, hi. What is it with the women in your family? I was just doing a murder series in honor of the wedding. Hey, this is real blood. Yeah, Harriet gave it to me. She's a butcher. She owns a butcher shop. I need a picture of Harriet. Sorry, no can do. You took a picture of the party, I saw. It didn't come out. Look, Rose, I need a photo. The picture did not come out. It was unflattering and it made her look 10 pounds heavier. She's my sister. She's been implicated. She's been implicated in a crime. I need the photo to eliminate her as a suspect. 
and if she's not innocent, if, you know, she's quirky. If she's quirky, we'll save Charlie's life. Rose pulls out a photograph, Charlie and Harriet looking young and in love. Exterior, Dry Creek Lodge, late in the day. A beautiful old colonial mansion nestled in the mountains and forests of the Northwest, romantic and from another day. Charlie and Harriet pull up in front of it. The valets open the door for them. It's like a castle, Charlie. It's so beautiful. Welcome to the Dry Creek. You just beat the rainstorm. Two hours later and the roads will probably be closed. Great. If you could help us with the luggage, we have these two in the back seat. And uh... As they deal with the luggage, Harriet starts to walk away from the hotel, away from the car, rain falling on her head. She walks straight at the camera, so only we can see her expression. Her expression is one of simply losing it. Harriet? What are you doing, honey? Harriet turns around and smiles at Charlie. He smiles back. Interior lobby of Dry Creek Lodge, evening. Charlie and Harriet stand at the desk. Harriet is not quite paying attention. Her attention span has slipped to none. She's fidgety. She looks around suspiciously at everything and everyone. Welcome, sir. We have you with us for four nights, Mr. McKenzie. Dinner reservations are at 8.30. Great. Sounds terrific. Also, you might want to prepare some candles by the bed. We're expecting the rainstorm to get even worse. We might even lose power tonight. Did you hear that, Harriet? The storm. I can't think of anything more romantic than the two of us trapped in our room in the middle of a rainstorm. You okay, Harriet? Oh, uh, just a little headache. Excuse me, is there a drugstore in the hotel? I, I want to get some aspirin. Right, right beyond those trees, ma'am. Anything you need. Thanks. Uh, don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. Harriet walks off to the lobby store backwards, looking at Charlie. Charlie watches her walk off. The desk clerk sits staring at Charlie. You think she's really got a headache? What? Ah, uh, nothing. Here's your key. You're in the open. Charlie looks back at the drugstore where Harriet is shopping. She waves to him. Charlie looks back at the desk clerk and grabs the key. Cut to fax of the photo of Charlie and Harriet coming out of a fax machine. Interior, Walter's plumbing, early evening. Walter, the owner of the plumbing store, dressed in overalls, takes the fax out and then picks up the phone. Yeah, that's Ralph Elliott's wife, all right. She had uh, shorter hair in those days. Interior martial arts studio, night. Master Cho, the new owner of the studio, dressed in a, a G, looks at the same fax. Mrs. Richter gained much weight since then, but it's definitely her. Interior of the Lizard's Lounge, Atlantic City. Randy Romano, the, on the owner, talks into the phone, holding up the fax photo of Charlie and Harriet. That's his little lollipop, all right, boy, he loved her. I'll tell you, she was a lot of fun, smart, doll face to boot. Interior, Tony's cubicle, night. Tony is on the phone. Kathy, seen before at the police station, stands with him. Circuits are out from the storm. Tony gets to the police station door and opens it. Kathy follows him. Keep trying the hotel. T tell the chief I just chartered a plane up to Oregon. The police captain enters. See that, Splendy? A gray hair. Every day, Splendy, I find another one. And it's all due to you. You get out there and you catch me some bad guys. Not now, Captain. Oh, I'm sorry. Tony <laughs> dashes out of the police station and into his car. Interior Charlie's hotel room, night. A beautiful suite with a fireplace burning a big stack of wood with another stack next to it with an axe in it. Music is playing softly on the stereo. And Charlie and Harriet have just finished making love underneath the covers, illuminated just by the light of the fireplace. This is the best honeymoon I could ever imagine, Harriet. If we had to pack and go home right now, I'd still think it was the greatest honeymoon ever. Harriet doesn't respond. Her head is turned from his. Don't you agree, Harriet? Harriet? He pulls the sheets away from her face to see that she's crying. What? What are you crying? What is it? It's, it's nothing. It's, it's just, I was just thinking we're married now and I always wanted to try to have kids and What are you talking about? I, you're going to be a great mom. I know you will. It's just, I, I get scared that certain things will happen or... Oh. There's nothing I'd like to do more than have kids. It, it, it's going to be great. It's not that, Charlie. What then? 
You're gonna laugh. Tell me. Of course I'm not gonna laugh. Kids are, kids is a big thing. It's hard. I'm sure I have the same fears. If we have kids, Charlie, um, things happen. Kids are healthy and fine and some are. And I don't know if I could live with myself if I gave birth to a child with webbed feet. Charlie stops to think about this. Webbed feet? Webbed feet? You're laughing. Uh, no, I'm not laughing. You, you think that's silly? No, no, that's the natural fear. I've thought about that fear. It really worries me, Charlie. Well, look, they have doctors, I assume, that deal only with webbed feet. And God forbid, and I'm talking strictly hypothetically, should that happen, we'll find one. You're the greatest, Charlie. Thanks. We should get ready for dinner. Exterior, interior, chartered Cessna night. A small plane flies through the clouds. It's just Tony and Dennis the pilot. Dennis never really realizes this is more than a sightseeing tour and constantly points out scenic points along the way. Now at your left side, you can see the Sierra Nevada, which is the largest mountain range west of the Rockies. Great Rockies, I don't care, Oregon, boom. Interior Charlie's hotel room at Dry Creek Lodge, night. Charlie is dressed very sharply in a sport coat and tie. He yells into the bathroom where we can see part of Harriet from behind. You almost ready? The first seating is in five minutes. I just want to look good for you, Charlie. That's all. I'm sure you look great. I'm sure you look... Harriet turns the corner wearing a nice dress. Her hair looks okay. She's wearing perfume. The only problem is she has two lines of mascara running down her cheeks. She's been crying. Charlie looks curious. Do I look okay, Charlie? Yes. Well... Charlie points to his own eye. What's wrong? Nothing. You... You kind of look like Tammy Faye Baker right now. She looks in the mirror. Oh, yeah. She goes back into the bathroom. Exterior Cessna night. The plane descends towards the runway. The rain comes down hard. As we prepare to land, you can see off to our left, Lake Shannon, which is one of the Just biggest- land. Don't, don't worry about Lake Shannon. I don't give a shit about Lake Shannon. The yep. plane touches down. Exterior dry creek lodge tonight. Rain pours frantically on the Gothic castle. Wind blows hard. A toast to our new friends, Charlie and Harriet. Interior beautiful French restaurant and, and hotel night. A beautiful dining room with a small dance floor. Charlie sits at an intimate table for two with Harriet. A small band plays in the background as the band leader is making the toast. The five or six other couples in the restaurant also hold up their glasses. We're very honored to be here for this very special day. And the concierge at this point interrupts to bring Charlie a telephone. Everyone stops and watches and waits. I'm sorry to interrupt, sir. There's a phone call for you from town. They say it's quite urgent. The toast, as well as the entire room, stops, almost like an E.F. Hutton commercial, waiting for Charlie's phone call to finish. Hello. Interior airport in Oregon, early evening. Tony speaks into the phone frantically. Charlie, you okay? Intercut Great. phone call, sorry. Oh, sorry. Couldn't be better. Charlie, listen to me. It's her. Harriet is Mrs. X. She killed Ralph and the two other men. Charlie looks up across the table at Harriet, who is completely caught up in the event of seeing how long she can keep her hand in the candle before it hurts. She puts it in, smiles, then takes it out. She shakes her hand and repeats the process. Look, that's great. It just so happens, though, that I met Ralph, and much to my delight, not only is she alive, but she's female. I thought I told you. Harriet looks at Charlie very suspiciously. He looks back at her and tries to smile, pretending that he's having a pleasant and completely irrelevant conversation. Rose had, Rose had a picture. It checked out. It's her, Charlie. She is the murderer. Charlie, your food is getting cold. Charlie waves one minute to Harriet as she watches. So what do I do? I called the police. All the roads are closed, but they're on their way. In, in the meantime, just... The line goes dead. Hello? Hello? What's the matter, Charlie? The phone just went dead. 
I was on the phone and it went dead. Oh, that's quite common, sir. I'm sure the lines will be out in the whole city till tomorrow. Enjoy your meal, sir. The concierge takes the phone away. Charlie turns slowly to Harriet, genuinely scared. What happened, Charlie? Nothing. Nothing happened. Just the lines are down. Phone lines. Suddenly, the band leader continues with his toast. So to these two young people, we wish them a long and happy life together and would like to play their song, The Platters, Only You. The band starts to play Only You. People applaud. Harriet and Charlie just stare at each other. He knows. The older couple at the next table, Mr. and Mrs. Levenstein, lean over to their table. How about the traditional bride and groom dance? Another couple walks by and pulls them literally out of their seats and onto the dance floor. Come on. It's a tradition. Charlie finds himself in the middle of the dance floor, dancing slowly with Harriet. He's scared out of his mind. The music plays in the background. Harriet smiles strangely at him. He tries to smile back, checking all the exits, planning an escape. Then suddenly, call it luckily, Mr. Levinson interrupts. Excuse me, could I cut it on your dance? Of course, sure. Charlie gives her hand away to Mr. Levinstein. He takes Mrs. Levinstein's hand and starts to dance towards the exit when suddenly the electricity goes out. The music is out, the lights are out. In the dimmest of lights provided from the cloud-covered moon outside, Charlie runs across the dance floor, fighting for an exit to the outside. He arrives in someone's arms on his way. I need your help. You have to help me. I've married a... The lights go back on and Charlie is in Harriet's arms again. Her face is near menacing now. She smiles with a very disturbed grin. He doesn't know what to say. Hello, Charlie. Charlie and her are squared off, neither speak. Suddenly, both of them are lifted into the air. They look down and see the waiters and busboys picking them up onto chairs, throwing them up in the air again and again. The music plays along loudly. Harriet watches Charlie very closely as Charlie looks scared. Then the people start to carry them out of the room and down the hallway. Let's take them to their room. But yeah, I'm sure they've had enough of these crowds for one night. My dinner. I didn't finish my dinner yet. Smile, Charlie. Act like you're having a good time. Interior, Oregon Airport. Same night. Uh, Tony is talking to an attractive young girl behind the airport rent-a-car booth. I'm sorry, sir. The roads are all closed. We can't rent any cars this evening. You have to rent me something. I've got to get up there. My friend's in danger. Interior, Charlie and Harriet's room. Night. The other hotel guests uh, throw them inside. The room is all made up. The sheets are pulled down. The firewood is cut. The axe is in the wood. Have a good night, you two. Come on in. Stay for a night's gap. Ah, oh, no. You two want to be alone. See you. Stay for a nightcap. Sir, I really don't think I should. Stay for a nightcap! <laughs> Bellboy is frightened and runs away. Stay for a nightcap! Harriet pulls Charlie back into the room, frightened that he's leaving. Don't go, Charlie! Exterior airport night. Tony runs out of the airport terminal where he sees a man in his 40s who's just entered his four-wheel drive Jeep. Excuse me, sir. I'm with the San Francisco Police Department. I'm on official business. I'm afraid I have to commandeer your vehicle. No. What do you mean, no? I happen to know for a fact that you don't have the power to commandeer my vehicle. This is true. Police, can I commandeer your vehicle? No. Where are you going? To the Dry Creek Lodge. I'll give you a lift. Well, I don't want a lift. I really want to commandeer the vehicle. Please just let me commandeer the vehicle. Why don't you just let me drive you there? Really, I don't mind. It's on the way. You're not going to bend on the commandeering thing, are you? No. Well, if we get stopped, will you at least let me say that I commandeer the vehicle, but I let you drive? I'm uncomfortable with that. Please. All right. Interior, Charles and Harriet's room. Charlie and, uh, Charlie and Harriet are all alone. The voices trail off down the hallway until they disappear. Charlie and Harriet stare at each other. Harriet blocks the door. Charlie looks around the room. The axe, the corkscrew, the letter opener, the fountain pen. At this point, everything in the room looks like a potential weapon. Harriet, Harriet takes, takes the, the axe. axe. 
I heard you on the phone before, Charlie. There's something I've got to tell you. Harriet, I... I've married before. I already know. About my husband's? Yes, and I was meaning to have a word with you. We could get it in a moment. Ah! Suddenly the power goes off again. They're both in the dark, a scuffle. Charlie has restrained Harriet, throws her in a walk-in closet and locks it. From behind the door, we hear Harriet wailing, which continues. Charlie picks up the ax, looks at it, relieved at his lucky escape. He rushes to the door to escape. He opens it and standing there is Rose. Ah, Rose, I never thought I'd be so glad to see you. Rose smiles. Charlie puts down the ax. The lights flicker back on. Uh, maybe the phones are working by now. He listens for a dial tone. Beside the phone, he sees a note. He starts to read it. Dear Harriet, I just can't handle the commitment. I'm leaving you. Signed, Charlie. And behind him, Rose approaches with the axe raised. What the hell is this? I didn't write this. And at that moment, he turns to find the axe being flung through the air at his head. He ducks just in time. What the fuck? She takes another swing and she hits the lamp off the desk and the room is in completely darkness. <laughs> Charlie, why did you marry Harriet? I warned you not to marry her, didn't I? I warned all of them, but none of them listened to me. They all went ahead and married her. She's the pretty one. Where's Harriet? Why did he turn with my sister Harriet? Nothing, Rose. If you've done something to my sister Harriet, I swear to God I'll kill you. We stay in Charlie's hip pocket as he tries to get away from what he can't see. He stays very silent. Where are you, Charlie? What, what's going on? Then Rose strikes a match. She lights a candle and comes toward him. He looks around. The window is open and Charlie is gone. Interior commandeered car at night. Tony and the commandeered man drive through the swampy winding road on the way up to the hotel. Tony is drumming on the dash. You stop doing that, please. <laughs> this bothers you? No, it's my favorite thing. The exterior castle-like round tower, ledge of tower, night. Charlie tight ropes along the ledge of the building. The storm continues. Rose comes out on the ledge and starts to chase him. He rounds the bend. Charlie looks into one room and sees Mr. and Mrs. Levenstein there. There's loud opera music playing in the room. Call the police. Interior of the Levenstein's room, night, same. The Levensteins prepare for bed. Charlie races by their window, then Rose races by. Call the police. Mr. Levenstein closes the curtains, he can't hear. Exterior ledge. Charlie races along the slippery ledge, almost falling at several points. Rose then appears on the roof holding the ax still. <laughs> Charlie, you like your note? <laughs> that was pretty aggressive. The husband's notes. I for genuine pen writing. I can write a new style. See, I'm an artiste. Harriet isn't an artiste. Sure, she had a husband, but she could never have done this. I mean, you know what I'm most proud of. What's that, Rose? Harriet never knew. She really almost left her. <laughs> I, I protect my sister. Charlie turns and runs. Rose chases him. Interior bedroom. Tony breaks into the room with his gun drawn. Charlie! Tony? Is that you? It's me, Harriet. I'm in here. Carefully, Tony opens the closet door. Tony, Rose is trying to kill Charlie. They're all on the ledge. Get on the floor. Put your hands behind your back. Harriet willingly goes, goes on the floor. Sure, anything. You've got to save Charlie. Tony slaps cuffs on her and takes her to the window. Interior bedroom. Tony is standing with his back to the window between it and Harriet. She looks out of the window and screams. <sighs> ah, look, it's Charlie. From Harriet's POV, we see Charlie on the ledge edging along. He stops in horror when he sees Harriet, glances back to the pursuing Rose and rushes off. 
Tony looks behind him out the window. Nobody's there. Nice try. I swear to you, it was Charlie. Look, no, there's Rose. Rose looks into the room with the ax in her hand. No, you don't. I beg you, look, it's Rose. Oh no, not again. Ah, Rose. Interior Levenstein's window. There's opera music playing. Charlie rushes by past the window. There's a beat and he comes back, staring inside in amazement. Reverse angle. Mr. Levenstein is in a Viking outfit. Mrs. Levenstein is in full Norse regalia. Interior Levenstein's window. Charlie gulps and rushes on, hastily pursued by Rose. Interior the roof. Rose pulls the axe back and swings, and the momentum of the swing pulls her feet out from under her. And on the slippery, icy roof, she falls and starts to slide. Just as she's about to go off the 50-foot high roof, Charlie climbs down the roof. He stands over her. She's about to slip. Her hands are losing strength. Her fingers are slipping. The rain is falling harder and harder. Charlie walks over to the cage where she's hanging on for life. He leans down to help her up, but just as he grabs onto her hand, the drain pipe she's holding onto slips. She's now dangling from the roof, the rain falling harder and harder. Charlie now is nowhere near her. He then gets down on his knees on the roof and starts to climb down the side of the drain pipe to get her. Rose looks up helplessly at him, not really asking for his help, not denying it. She's accepted her fate. Policemen, ambulances, and spectators have gathered below in bunches as Charlie climbs down the drain pipe, he himself hanging on for dear life. He just reaches out far enough to grab her hand, and just as he does, her drain pipe tears and falls into the crowd below. Charlie, then with all of his strength, his where is this strength in my whole life strength, pulls her up to the roof next to him. Several policemen make their way onto the roof and come over to where Charlie is detaining Rose. The police take her, handcuff her, and cart her away. From the corner of the roof appears Tony. I hate to bother you on your honeymoon, Charlie, but... Charlie looks beyond Tony and sees Harriet standing in the doorway. He goes over and puts his arm around Harriet. Thank God. I'm sorry I doubted you. But I thought you were the killer, but you were acting pretty strange. I thought you were going to leave me, like all the others. Thank God they were just murdered. I thought they were always leaving me. Below, Rose is put into a police car and taken off. The sirens disappear, so do the crowds. Dissolve into the sound of a crowd in a club. Interior Spalletti's coffee house. Charlie is on stage looking very beatnik. He's reading his poetry, but we can't hear it. He nods to someone off stage. Harriet is in the audience, also looking very beatnik with their three-year-old son, Stuart, a miniature beatnik version of Charlie. My dad was right. You don't lose your muse once you're married. Nothing changed, except I gained a great son, Stuart. Sound up on Charlie's poetry. Married man, most merry, and in conclusion, this poem, this poem sucks. sucks. <laughs> the crowd goes crazy. Thank you very much. House music kicks on. It's Saturday night by the Bay City Rollers. S A T U R D A Y. Night. Charlie comes off stage and uh, joins his wife and child at their table. He's very happy. Fade out, the end. And that is our reading for the night. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you in the next one.